Thank you for tuning into Growing Tech Fast, the condensed podcast in which conversations about growing SaaS startups are had with those who have grown them. Today, we're joined by Jeff Manning, a veteran sales leader in the technology space. How are you today, Jeff? Doing well. How are you, Joe? I'm very well, thanks. It's Friday afternoon, so I'm happy. Yeah, right on. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to welcome you and thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. So <clears throat> rather than me rehashing um, your current role, uh, you've co-founded a business, you've been um, working on it for six years, 802 Secure. Uh, why don't you uh, give us a pitch and tell us what you do there? We are uh, solving the, the problem in the industry today of IoT and OT um, visibility, uh, performance and, and security and cost control uh, in what we'll call kind of a hyperwin environment and a hyperlan environment when you have multiple technologies that are all broadcasting and using wireless uh, to connect to things for their workflows uh, it creates a, a vulnerability uh, environment uh, that is not seen on the wire so our technology our platform uh, is purpose-built we you know we call it a wireless machine vision platform uh, as lock technologies to uh, inspect and interrogate all of the wireless traffic that we see on layer two, and that's everything. It's not just Wi-Fi. It's Zigbee, Z-Wave, LoRa, Zigfox, Cellular. There's so many different types of technologies uh, in that space, and that's the challenge, right? There's multiple vendors, multiple operating systems, multiple languages and protocols and channels, and to, to decipher that is a big job. So that's the problem we've set out to solve is basically uh, – doing asset detection and classification and vulnerability analysis of every single thing in your environment that's talking, whether you know it or not, or whether you own it or not. It's meaningful to the business to understand what's out there. And uh, like I said, it, the, the traditional methodology is just to rely on the wired side network and all of those controls, which are all very good. But, but our, our thesis is that it's incomplete. <laughs> you're, only, mm. you're only managing what you can see and what you know, but there's a lot of other stuff. So um, business is strong and, and, and like I said, in it, right now at this point in time uh, with the 30 to 40 billion IOT devices out there in the wild that are performing some form of a function for a business to not be able to see what's happening to it is a threat. It's, it's a vulnerability that, that needs to be addressed and we're addressing it. Six, I mean, six years ago, Jeff, it was quite um, visionary. I've just um, finished um, reading a book called digital Darwinism. I don't know if you're uh, I've not familiar heard of it, with no. it, um, but it, it was essentially talking <clears throat> about you know sort of yeah the next big things and the iot space is about to blow up right, right. and that's kind of i suppose um industry 4.0 as as we right. call it in europe exactly same um yep. same same in the us yep. it's you know the different revolutions which we're going through and this is number four and and it sounds like your company is already sort of matured and is ready to sort of really hit the ground growing the yeah, for sure. But I, I would say this, it wasn't visionary necessarily. It was evolutionary. It was uh, flexibility, right? We went, to, we went to market with a function that is not what it is today. And that's, mm. I think, part and parcel to the conversation we want to have today is how do you build an organization the right way? And the most important thing you have to do is the foundation blocks of that business have to be flexible to change and adaptable to change. You cannot be dogmatic in your approach to your business. You can't mm. Uh, oversubscribe to your own stories. You have to listen to the market. And uh, we went to market to build an enhanced Wi-Fi security solution. Uh, my partner and I and, and all of us came out of Air Defense, which was a uh, really the, the market leader in wireless security for Wi-Fi 10 years ago. We were acquired by Motorola. It's now, and they, they parceled it off and sold it. I don't even know where it sits anymore, but it's still in existence. But the point is we brought to market Wi-Fi security in a better way. But we were... Um, flexible enough and innovative enough to realize that the story was incomplete. And if we took what we had, which was one piece of the puzzle and continued to build on it, then we could grow with the market, if not a little bit ahead of it. And that's where we are today. And uh, so the point is what you are on day one is not what you're going to become. Uh, and if you do it the right way, uh, you can grow with the market or ahead of the market, but not, you can't stay in your swim lane as a startup. You've yeah. got to realize that this thing is going to change. And uh, if you're not an adaptable person, if you're not a, you know, if I see, you see it all the time, tech companies are just, they built this thing and they're so proud of their thing as they should be. 
getting a company off the ground is virtually impossible. It's, it's like the hardest thing on earth, right? To build a business Absolutely. Uh, and get people to buy into your vision. But you, as the leader of a company and the executive team of a company, have to be wise enough to know, listen, we, we did this thing, but what's next? Are we on the right path? Are we, are we solving the right problems? Are, are we listening in the right way? Or are we just, like I said, dogmatic that this is it and this is everybody should come over to us and do this? You will die. Uh, and, and, and you will die a long, slow death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, I mean, you know, that kind of, as you say, you know, that flexibility, it really does resonate with what, you know, the, this entire podcast is about. It's about, you know, making mistakes and, and learning from them and moving forward. And, you know, failure makes us better people. It does. Right, for sure. Um, I always tell people, hey, I win or I learn. Uh, I would like to win more than I learn. I feel like I know enough. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's no losing if you do it the right way. You just, you win or you pivot. You win and you pivot. And you're always kind of tacking, like sailing a boat. You're tacking and uh, left and right, left and right. Uh, if you don't, you're just going to drift. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, and, and that's, you know, kind of the crux of, you know, I think that, you know, one of your real um, passions is kind of, you know, learning from the mistakes of, of when, you're, when you're going to markets and, and um, kind of, readjusting and, and, and repositioning yourselves. And, you know, I've heard you speak before about this mistakes of structuring sales teams, Jeff. Mm. And I thought it's a really great point, you know, so why don't you maybe give us some, um, an example of perhaps a mistake that has happened when you've been involved with or, or seen from the outside of, uh, you know, st structuring that sales team, not necessarily the first person, but you're growing and, and then trying to, learn from that and grow from that yeah so this is really really important i think what what i've seen a lot <clears throat> i'm a student of life right so I, I do what i do for a living but i also like to observe other things and stay connected to my peers in the industry and just talk and, and read and listen and learn but what, what i see a lot is uh we, we all we all march to an artificial velocity that's put upon us by outside influences typically monetary i.e <laughs> investors uh and I don't mean that in a negative way, they're, they're, but, but you, you have an investment thesis, you have a business thesis, and you have typically kind of, or in the royal you have typically gone to market saying, hey, I just, once I get this thing ready, I just need salespeople, I'm going to go sell this thing. Uh, I, I would suggest to you that there is a formula uh, before sales that a lot of people skip through. Uh, sales is, um, it's a verb. <laughs> It's to me, if it's not, it's a verb. You, it's a function that you perform after some other things are, are done and, and, and you're ready and the market is ready to receive that activity. Uh, and what I'm getting at is very simply this. You need to invest in business development. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, and I don't mean lead gen business development. I mean, business development, develop some big brothers in the industry, strategic alliances. Is there any OEM, some hooks, some pull through stuff that will feed an organization and sustain them over time. Uh, you need marketing to be humming before sales. And lately, what I've seen over the past 36 months or so, 24 to 36 months, is this pivot away from the way we used to sell in an outbound capacity. You know, dialing for dollars doesn't work. It's a waste of time. Uh, you need to have a really, a really good marketing automation platform in place uh, because the buyer's journey has very much changed. It needed to change. And, they, and, and what they do now is the customer says, okay, I, I read something interesting and I want to know more about it. Can I use that in my environment? They self-educate or I heard something or I have a problem and I want to investigate it. So they go out into the world, the interwebs, right? <laughs> they pull down what they need and they start to educate. And that education leads to more education and more questions and more answers. So your marketing automation engine has to feed a content, very rich and robust content library that paints a picture for the customer before you make first contact and then they will find you. And so that the calculus of how you bring a product to market is changing. And so if you're going to go out and build a business and hire a bunch of salespeople, I would submit you're going to waste millions of dollars and you're going to spin through a lot of early churn on that sales force because you're not ready for them. Build the engine, build the alliances and the pull through mechanisms that are going to sustain you throughout a long sales process. Uh, and, and then you hire your people. And, it, and, and I think one of the other things, sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but one of the no, other please. things is, and I've seen this in my own businesses, when you build a business, uh, founders have contacts and founders will sell to early adopters, friends and family, you know, previous contacts. That Rolodex is not that big. 
when you, and so your thesis is flawed. Oh, all I needed to do was X, Y, and Z and I'm selling product to these people. Yes, but the mass market is not gonna buy from you in the same way that they did. Those are longstanding relationships. So you really have to be honest with yourself and say, what's, what's my insertion strategy into the broader market, not just the people I know. And, and I, that's a harder one for founders to get beyond as well. I think they find out the hard way that, oh, I, I can't sell anymore. And I need to change the way I do business. Uh, so anyway, as you'll find with me, Joe, I'll give a very long answer to a very simple question. Um, no, Jess, that, <clears throat> they're fantastic points. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to just draw some more out on, on two of them, really. I think first is that um, kind of self-education play that I suppose has changed. Uh, I mean, when, when did you enter sales, Jeff? Uh, so... I don't want to tell you how old I am, but I've been, <laughs> I've been in tech for 25 years and, and I've done various things from marketing to business development to actually started in project management and technology team in the mid nineties. So yeah, sure. it's been a while. And so I've been in sales for a long time. Sure. And, and, and when, you know, when you were prospecting, you know, I say 20 years ago, uh, calling up on behalf of your company and then you're, you're taking someone on the entire sales journey, right? You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, speaking to them you're getting them bought in you're educating them but what you're saying here now is that really people are more empowered because of the interweb because of okay. uh, contacts linkedin to actually sort of educate themselves before they come to a salesperson so uh, it, a long way around the question i suppose um you know is the sales landscape uh, as a as a as a sales person changing for for changing it is yeah and, and in a good way and in a bad way and i think the good way is this when you do become engaged you're you're becoming engaged with someone you're there's less conceptual selling they've mm -hmm. already t typically they've, if, if they've agreed to meet with you they've already bought into the concept right so you're not necessarily doing the evangelical piece as much you will have to do it in a large deal depends on the on the type of deal we're talking about. You might have to go through other BUs and help that person sell. But the, the person bringing you in is you're gonna be your champion. They've already bought off on the concept. Mm -hmm. That's why they agreed to meet with you. They already did their homework. They know you're one of the two or three or four that Gartner recommends or whatever it is that they used yeah. Yeah. as their, their criteria to, to bring people in. Now you're, in. now you're competing for the business. So in that way, I think a lot of the sales journey has been taken away from the sales rep, mm. but they're getting a decent, what I'll call a pre-qualified activity fewer of them um but they're pre-qualified at least conceptually so now you now you're in a knife fight <laughs> against somebody yeah. else you may not know who they are you're competing against you're competing against antipathy from other people in the organization no activity whatsoever competing for spend against other completely unrelated projects or you're competing finally and lastly against the people who you think are your competitors the other manufacturers or service providers of what you do. So the journey has definitely changed. And, and I think in the bad way uh, is that you can't control the narrative as much as mm. you used to be able to, mm. meaning you're not the one introducing the concept. The ideal sales journey back in the day was you're the one bringing the fire extinguisher to the fire. And they were going, oh my God, this is magic, right? Yeah. Well, now they already know the extinguisher exists. They've looked at three or four of them. Why is yours better, cheaper, faster? Mm. Uh, so again, you can't. You're not. You're not the guy who made fire or, or the or the fire extinguisher. You're not the, the the magician. Your archetype has changed. Now you're just a warrior trying to compete for the business. Absolutely. So I suppose you know in in that sense, then if 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 you know potential clients are more engaged with the product, is this meaning that you know perhaps you know traditional sales people especially in highly technical environments like cybersecurity or or marketing technology are they become is there is there a need for them to become more and more technical themselves and not rely for example because surely if 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 a potential client already knows about the product and that it exists mm -hmm. could they not just go straight to a you know a, a sales engineer to for, for to learn more about it or yeah, but there's, so there's, there's, okay, this is the art and the science, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's another mistake companies make. Uh, well, we don't need salespeople. We just need technical sales guys yeah. uh, to get them through the POC. Uh, or we don't need technical sales guys, uh, or SEs. We just need a sales guy. The product sells itself. Neither of those two things is true. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you're selling a hyper-commoditized product in a hyper-commoditized market. Okay, mm -hmm. then fine. Then you need transactional salespeople, and that's all you need. Someone to take orders. Good for you. 
you know, declare victory and go home, you win. You know, you're, you're, you're in the late majority or laggard stage. You're on a price game probably, but you're shipping product left and right. So that, that's fine. Good for you. Um, but the reality is I tell you that customers are self-educating. They are, but they're incorrectly self-educating some of it, right? So half of what they think is, is true. Half of it is FUD or lies or, or market texture being sold by the competition. So you still need to be technically savvy enough to unwind the wrongness in their, in their understanding and remap it to, okay, good. You've got a kind of a general overview of what's going on here. That's good. You think you kind of need this. Let me tell you, let me tell you what's really going on, however. So you, you, you have to be savvy enough to list, let them educate you on what they know and then rewire it. Cause some of it's just wrong. They're not, they're not in the industry and in a lot of what they're reading is lies, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. And I don't mean that in a negative. I just mean, it's architecture. It's, yeah. it's designed to shape an idea about, if you're looking at four different companies' websites and reading their stuff, you're going to come away with four sets of ideas about how the same outcome should result. How, how do you get there? You have to rewire them, remap them to your reality. And that's a very artful thing to do. Um, and if you can find a technical, um, an SE that can do that, and, they, and there are some out there, and they're, I mean, good God, they're worth their weight in gold, that are savvy enough to to not just be ones and zeros, but to be psychology as well and realize mm -hmm. what story needs, how to do that, then you're, yeah, carry on. But they're very, very, very few and far between. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad, you know, I, the, we, I have these constant um, arguments and, and, and conversations with people. Is it a science? You know, can you just, is it just very data driven? You can follow the numbers and you'll get the cell. But no, of course not. There needs to be the art, of selling there needs to be the you know psychology as you say the emotional intelligence from the salesperson to truly listen to and, and i say clear for all that fud uh okay. where perhaps they've gone wrong and and really answer uh their needs right a data driven that that term drives me nuts yeah it it presumes that you can take the humanity out of the equation and make it a flawless mathematical exercise you can't do that yeah and there's no yeah, you can't do that. Data's a, it's a validating point, but it's mm -hmm. not the point. And mm -hmm. so when people reverse the math and go data first, humans last, I, I'll compete against that all day long. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it works. And uh, look, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I can tell you, to me, data-driven means you've, you've given over your insight, your intuition, and your thoughts mm -hmm. to somebody else's math which has been manufactured to get you to a certain point. It's the same with, with the world today. People don't inspect things. They don't do their own research on things because it's just it's time, right? I'm just going to accept what this talking head reading a teleprompter is telling me to feel about a certain thing. And that's how we get into a situation where nobody knows what truth is anymore. Yeah. Sorry, I just went off the reservation there. But the point is <laughs> you have to re-inject humanity into the process uh, data as a validating, as coming in behind you to validate what, what you're trying to get them to, to understand. And, yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, so, so I suppose, you know, it, it, in regard to the, you know, to sort of just look b back at startups and, and, and really getting the sales off the ground and many companies don't have those functions, um, product, uh, marketing, uh, BDRs in before they decide to go to market because of you know, a number of things. It could be, as you said before, VCs up the back or, or, you know, the need to just get sales going, get their name out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether that's right or wrong, to what extent is the traditional first boots on the ground salesperson who comes along with his, you know, black book still applicable in this day and age, do you think? Uh, it, it, to some extent it is, and it, but, but here's the, the fundamental, I'll, I'll come back around to that, but I wanted to touch on something else you said. The way that people generally build their team plans, it is, it is a, a money exercise. You do an annual operating plan and you say, okay, I have to get to 5 million, whatever the number is, um, because I told the investors that I was going to do that. How do I do it? And to sit there and look at an investor in the eye and say, I'm going to get to 5 million by rolling out a HubSpot marketing automation tool and hiring a product marketing guy and a business development guy. It doesn't, they don't quote a carry. So it doesn't drive the bottom line of that spreadsheet. So your business thesis is being driven by a spreadsheet. Make no mistake about it. Whereas some financial people who invest and they have a right to do this, have invested in the business, want to know how do you get there. And it's hard to look at them and say, here's what I need to do. 
year one, I'm going to build a foundation of this thing. They don't care. They want, they want to know how many people you're going to hire, what quarter you're going to give them, and when are they going to start selling. And um, that ruins businesses. If, you, if you're not strong enough to punch through that or if you don't have early sales from the founding team to kind of buy you some time, you're going to build a team that, um, like I said before, is going to have very little success, if any, and it's going to start to churn out and the market's going to see you as a company just churning through people and what's wrong with you? Why don't people stay? Build the foundation for it. No house can stand without the foundation. Build yeah. the foundation. Be pragmatic. Be honest with yourself, honest with your investors or whomever it is uh, that here's how we're going to go to market. If you're, um, like I said, if you're selling fire extinguishers and the world's on fire, don't worry about that. Just ship. You'll be fine. But if you're trying to build a business of an emerging technology business where, uh, where there's a market readiness condition that has to happen and, uh, and it's going to take some time, just say, hey, listen, I, I need to build the engine first before I put any tires under this thing or put a shell around it. So give me some time. And, and then when you hire salespeople, there is, there is a, a flow to the business. You can show them how many leads they're going to get. And too often people come in and say, okay, yeah, we don't have a lead engine. Who do you know? Who are you going to sell it to? And I, I mean, that's, that's hard. It's really hard. And yes, you will get some wins that way. You, you will, but not enough to sustain the business. Um, yeah. Maybe a couple of quick wins. Maybe you get lucky. A guy knows a guy, plays golf with. We'll take a, a yeah. flyer on it and buy something. Sure, fine, great. Better than not having that. I, I'm not denigrating that at all. What I'm saying is it's not the way to build a business. It's a, yeah. it's a it's quick sustainable. hit. It's sustainable. It's yeah. a quick hit. It's something you can go to you know, your, to somebody and say, oh, we got this deal going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not repeatable or scalable. It's, it's, you got lucky. Yeah. So you need that support behind. You need all those things in place. And as you say, the foundations, you know, you need to build a business on strong foundations, certainly. There's a lot of early money, Joe, spent on developing the technology, and there has to be because you're in the tech business. But I think I don't think you need to build it completely. I think it's kind of like a flywheel. I think when you get like halfway through to two, you shot, you ought to be building the, the next the go to market, right? So, which because the best technology in the world doesn't matter. It will die in the vine if there's no go to market. Mm. It will just die. Right? Nobody yeah. will ever see it. It'll die on the bench. You'll shut the lights off and the, flan, the fans will stop blowing and the lights will stop blinking. And that's just the way it is. But if you can, if you can have this flywheel kind of mentality, like, listen, we're going to get an MVP, minimally viable product. We're going to get a couple of pilots going down. I, I need my go to market built. I need to take it to, um, you know, larger companies to, you know, I, I need to just start getting my name out there in the ecosystem and who are my ecosystem channels to part uh, to market going to be and, and work on those. Um, don't wait till the product's finished. Spend some of that early money you had on that piece as well. Jeff, that's, you know, so in, in, insightful, I think. And I think where many, you know, startups get it wrong and have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, you see it, I've, you know, you see it time and time again. Many get it very right. Uh, and many get lucky. People do get lucky, as you say. Oh, God, you have to be somewhat lucky. You just have yeah. to be lucky. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to take credit for being the fact that, hey, I was lucky. You know, we yeah. got lucky. And that's okay. Listen, sometimes you make your own luck, but sometimes you just get lucky. And I, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Good for you. Run with it. Run with it. Yeah, exactly. take it and run. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but look, I, you know, um, I think there's been fantastic insights there. But it'd be great to just, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jeff. What, what you know, really drives you, um, you know, how have you come to this position um, where you're kind of co-founding a business, looking at go-to-market strategies? You've built out entire sales um, divisions uh, at, from the ground up for certain companies. What, what, you know, what drives you really, Jeff? I like, um, I like human factors. I like, I like the, the people part of the equation. Yeah, I'm in technology, uh, but I'm not a technophile. I, I, uh, my, my education is in law and psychology. So I come at it from a really weird place, right? I'm a weird dude. But I, what I find is I enjoy being the, the guy that's, that's the non-technophile in the room uh, because I feel like I can move through the shadows and the raindrops a little differently than those guys. They go head on. You know, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a knife fight. These guys, who's the smartest guy in the room? Um, but I really enjoy the human element of it, navigating the needs, understanding the requirements, listening better than anyone in the room if I can. And then in synthesizing a solution that's not technical, but it's human. And, and what I found is people just want their needs met. Uh, and it's not always the need that you thought you were there to meet. There's a lot of times there's hidden agendas, there's political agendas, there's other things going on that we're all humans. And if you can put aside um, a lot of the 
technology sometimes. Just assume that your shit works. <laughs> as good as or better than the other one. Yeah. What are the other problems? And, I, and I'm guarantee it will. Right? You can make anything work in a lab. You can solve any problem. People are smart. It's engineering. It's code. We can write it to make it whatever it is. What are the other problems we're working on here? Um, uh, is it, it's always trust, first of all. Am I going to lead you to success or to ruin? I have to solve that a part of the equation. That's my job. But what else? What are these people's personal uh, agendas? What are their, what are, um, uh, their professional aspirations? How do we help them achieve any of those? And motion? Uh, because I find that's where a lot of energy is. There's just energy and transformation. And I like, I like emerging technologies. I like transformative stuff. I like to change the way people do things and, and, and have an impact in that way. So I've always just, I don't know, I've had a really fun, tumultuous, devastating, amazing, wonderful career in technology. I've had everything you can have, every human emotion uh, in this career because of those things. It's always changing. It's always transforming. People move around a lot. They get into new things. You kind of figure out what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It's fun. I mean, that, that, you know, interest and passion for the human side of the company is really, you know, come across in, throughout the entire, um, entire podcast here, uh, Jeff. And it's, it's, it's really great to see that, you know, in a, and, and you, you, you definitely need that, you know, in companies where, the, the, as you say, the product, of course, is, needs to be good, but you need to get both right. You know, you can't focus. You can't focus on uh, on one on their own, but work together seamlessly. And that's so good for, you know, for C levels and companies, uh, co-founders to have that um, sort of uh, partnership together, right? For sure, it's three legs on that stool: people, process, and product. What's yeah. my product? Right? Actually, in reverse order: who, who am I working with? Yeah. How are we working together? And what are we working on? Right? What's the product? How are we getting it to market? And who's doing it? And those are the three legs. And I think it's, and I've said this a million times and people are probably sick of hearing it. For me, it's always people first. Give me a subpar product with a broken system, but great people, we will have some success. Yeah. Give, me a, give me a bad product with some great people and a good process, we'll have a lot of success. Give me a great product and not the other two. It, I'm turning the lights off. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right, this yes. just doesn't matter. That's, I think that's a fantastic place to, to you know, end on. Uh, those, that three-legged stool, um, and as you say at the, you know, the, the head of that is, is certainly people, uh, it's a journey and you need to take people with you on that. Yeah. And have some fun, Um, have some fun doing it. Of course. (laughs) Good Lord. What else are we doing this for? I I know that you, you, you're big in personal developments, um, for yourself, um, for your reps. If you could, I'd just like you to leave our listeners with, with, with just one, perhaps one sales leader who you think our listeners should follow or listen to who has maybe helped you develop as a person? Yeah, well, I think it's just, Stephen Covey was always a, a, I was a big fan of Stephen Covey. He's a, a human approach, a real practical approach, but Simon Sinek to me is great. Uh, he's, I, you know, I was drawn to him not be, because we, we haven't offended. I, I, everything he says, I'm like, that's exactly what I say. That's exactly how I feel. I think this guy's right. And it's not about business and the, it's not about the tactical things of, of business and selling. It's about the human emotional thing of what, how do you, how do you separate yourself from the pack? Everybody else is the same. I mean, we, we have a, 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 an environment of sameness. That's just so nauseating. We all go to the same sales training. We all use the same lexicon in the industry. We all same, 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 be different. How are you going to be different? Pull back, have a different conversation, raise it up, have an emotional conversation, make a connection with someone, change their mind about just everything you're doing. And if you can be that person, then you are by definition transformational because you just changed the conversation and everybody's dying for it. They won't admit it, but nobody wants to have that conversation that they have with the same vendor doing the same thing, blah, 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 blah. You know, I don't mean to oversimplify this, but you really can be different just by asking different questions, having different conversations. Don't be afraid to differentiate yourself. There, there's, a, there's a thread that pulls you into this the formula, follow the formula and you'll be successful. That's bullshit. Be human and authentic in the moment with someone else who's vulnerable. And that's why you're there. They're vulnerable. They need something from you and, uh, and they will remember you and, and you will be on a completely different playing field. Again, stuff has to work. Uh, the price has to be kind of right, but you can be different and still win that. That's my advice. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Growing Tech Fast. You've been listening to Jeff Manning, co-founder, veteran sales leader with people-centric technology views. It's been a joy to have you, Jeff. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Talk to you later.